Yeah, so hello and welcome to our talk, Spectra and Meltdown versus real time. How much do mitigations cost? So why are we uh, doing all this? In the beginning of this year, people started to speculate on speculative execution of CPUs and that literally hit the core of our systems or the cores of our systems. There were many uh, CPU bugs that were disclosed since then. And there are already many benchmarks out there that investigate on the effect of those mitigations for um, desktop systems, for data center appliances. There are many benchmarks that focus on web servers like Nginx, Apache, on database servers, on compilation. Compilation is a popular benchmark. Video ND coding, apparently it appears that um, Git is also used as a benchmark. It does not only produce CPU load, it also produces disk I.O. load and many other benchmarks. But to the best of our knowledge, none of them um, focused on the effect of those mitigations on real-time systems where determinism and low latencies matter. Yeah, so what are we focusing on in this talk? We will only focus on variant one to four. There are many other uh, variants, but they will not be part of this talk. And the level one terminal fault L1TF, which was disclosed in, I think it was August this year. Yeah, so the commonality of those bugs is that they somehow, in a certain way, they uh, exploit speculative execution, they exploit branch prediction units um, together with the behavior of caches um, and time constrained side channel attacks. With this, attackers are able to leak sensitive information, and this breaks um, guarantees that were that are given by memory management unit, units such as um, the memory protection. So this is um, violated by those bugs and attackers may be able to read not only memory of other processes but also memory from kernel space and under certain conditions even arbitrary physical memory. <laughs> Nevertheless, we need to keep in mind that these are local vectors only. So an attacker needs to have arbitrary or needs to be able to execute arbitrary code on an affected system. If um, an affected system runs a browser which executes JavaScript, this is already the case, but we need to keep in mind that this is a local vector only. There are some other attacks like the NetSpectre that also um, forms a remote vector the so surface for a, for a remote attack, but uh, even under laboratory conditions, um, they were only able to leak um, bytes per hour. So this will not be focused on this talk. And um, we have to keep in mind that these are that these all of these attacks have a rather high complexity. So on the mitigations, we I will especially focus or particularly focus on x86 and on ARM64 platforms. Those are the platforms that we measured um, during our analysis. I do not want to go in greater detail on how those attacks work because they are very complex. I want to um, focus on the mitigations only. And for Spectra variant one, the bounce check bypass, we have the so-called user pointer sanitization, uh, where when we enter kernel space, we need to protect some input that might be uh, forwarded by the user, such as, for example, the system call number. The system call number, um, is a value that is used for an indirect array access in the kernel space and we need to protect that speculation is done on this value because the user has control over, over this value. Therefore, on both platforms we use the so-called no speculative accessors that are used to protect against um, this attack. Luckily, the cost per mitigation call uh, on those systems is rather low, so it comes at a low cost. For Spectra variant 2, it looks a bit different. On x86 as well as on ARM64, we have the config red line option on Linux, the return trampoline, which converts indirect calls, uh, indirect jumps to returns. And in this way, it, it again, it prevents speculation. In addition to that, on x86 as well as on ARM64, um, we now need 
possibility to control uh, speculative execution. And on x86, this is done by um, the speculative control extensions with, uh, which come with microcode updates for, uh, for Intel and AMD CPUs. And on ARM64, um, we apply those mitigations in the firmware, in the monitor. Um, to mitigate against variant 2, we need at least ARM trusted firmware version 1.6 which implements the system, uh, management calling, system management calling convention version 1.1. And we also need to fill return stack buffers on context switch. And in sum, this leads to a very high cost um, per mitigation call on those systems, especially on ARM64 where we need to uh, switch the privilege level to apply the mitigation. The to other variants, variant three and four, meltdown and speculative store bypass. For meltdown, uh, we now have the so-called page table isolation in the kernel. Initially, the page table isolation was implemented to, um, to have further protection for the address space layout randomization. Now this protection is also used to uh, mitigate the meltdown attack. On x86, it's simply called page table isolation. On ARM64, it's called the kernel page table isolation, or Kaiser, as it was initially um, named by the authors. They introduced different page directories for kernel space and for user space. So before, those, before page table isolation, um, the kernel space and user space sh shared the same pages. Now we have to unmap the kernel space pages from user space. Uh, which requires us on each context switch on, or on each switch to um, the kernel space to apply that mitigation to switch the page table entries. For variant 4, we again, we need some microcode updates. On ARM64, we again, we need an update for the ARM-trusted firmware. And authors say that variant 4 comes with a notable uh, performance impact. So mitigations are applied on a per-processor basis uh, using PR control and seccomp. The cost per mitigation, again, is of course very high. Variant 4 will not be a topic of this talk because we didn't activate it in our measurements. Then there is a slightly different attack, the level 1 terminal fault, also called foreshadow. On affected systems, um, we either want to disable symmetric multi-threading or use other mitigations um, to deal with this, uh, this issue. This is not a problem for real-time systems in particular because we deactivate symmetric multi-threading multi ever since because um, running real-time payloads across on uh, SMT siblings causes undesired side effects due to contention or uh, any other effects that come with symmetric multi-threading. So this is nothing new for, for the real-time folks. We disable SMT ever since. The second mitigation for um, the page table is the page table entry inversion, where we simply um, flip the upper bits of page table entries. This comes at a neglectable cost because we only apply a simple bit mask to the affected entries. So the cost per mitigation call for native workloads, for real-time workloads, for usual real-time workloads, is rather low, whereas for data center appliances or for virtualized environments, uh, level one terminal fault is very, very high. Okay, so that's on the mitigations and which CPUs are actually affected. Basically, um, all CPUs are affected to a certain de degree, uh, leading Intel. Um, they are vulnerable to Spectre variant 1, 2, 3, 4, and level 1 terminal fault, whereas AMD is not affected to version 3, uh, version three meltdown, and it is not affected to the level 1 terminal fault. There are also some non-speculative Intel variants like older um, Atom processors or Quark processors, those are also not affected by those attacks. On the ARM side of life, it looks a bit different. There are some CPUs that are affected to version 1. There are some that are affected to version 2. There are some that are affected uh, on version 4. No ARM CPUs are affected for the level 1 terminal fault, and only the Cortex-A75 is, uh, is vulnerable to meltdown. Uh, please look it up on those pages that are provided by uh, the vendors. Here you will get uh, exact detail which 
CPUs are affected to what degree. Okay, mitigations versus real time. What do now those uh, mitigations cost? And before I want to explain the measurements that we did, I we are, would like to refresh in the knowledge what real time actually means uh, on real time uh, systems in contrast to uh, desktop or server applications, uh, the determinism matters. Deterministic response to certain stimuli, to maybe external stimuli matters. Uh, we might have time sensitive reoccurring repetitive cyclic execution where we must not answer, uh, where we must give a response not too early and not too, um, and not too late. So we might have bounded latencies, a time window where we must give an answer. Uh, we must be sure that we, on every event, we are able to uh, give this answer within a certain time window. And in contrast to desktop systems, data center systems, we optimize for the worst case and not for the average case. So for those targets, determinism matters more than the actual throughput. And then there are the mitigations. There are the cheap ones that I explained, it's the page table entry inversion, the cheap one, the user pointer sanitization, also a cheap one. But then there are the expensive ones that at some points they might want to flush the caches, um, the translation look aside buffers. Uh, we have the page table isolation, the return stack buffer fills, the return trample lines, firmware calls on context switches. We have to replace the microcode to introduce new instructions to control um, speculative executions. So we have a lot of potential sources that introduce additional overhead um, to our systems and those mitigations might, of course, increase the latency and the behavior of those systems. And this is what we want to measure with our, um, with our tests. So the basic idea of our test is to run real-time payloads on multiple cores at once. We do this because we also want to measure side effects across cores like shared caches, like in the process communication calls. So we run our real-time payload across multiple cores. Then we want to measure the responsivity of the systems and we repeat those measurements with and without the mitigations enabled and with and without additional workload payload uh, on top of those CPUs to also measure um, additional side effects that might occur. Yeah, this is a standard problem of software product lines. We now have the combinatorial explosion of variants that we might want to measure. So we only uh, con confine on some certain measurements like one important measurement is to measure um, our system without any mitigation applied, so the, like the state at the end of 2017. And then we activate those mitigations that are necessary to protect uh, the vulnerabilities of those systems. For instance, on an AMD system, we will only, uh, we will apply the variant 2 mitigations, whereas on an uh, Intel x86 system, we will also apply uh, the page table isolation. And then for a bit fine-grained uh, analysis, we only um, analyze the page table isolation to get the, yeah, the impact of the page table isolation only, as well as the variant 2 only. And then we apply proper statistic analysis to, um, to strengthen the, yeah, the outcome, the, um, the truth of our results. The tools that we therefore use are standard real-time uh, is a standard real-time test, so our real-time payload is the well-known cyclic test. Um, cyclic test um, fires, um, uh, cyclically um, raises a timer interrupt and it measures then um, the jitter of the interrupt in the user space. If we have additional non-real-time payload as a stressor on those um, CPUs, we use the stress and cheat tool to produce additional load. We repeat this measurement in um, the hypervisor that we develop in our virtualized uh, environment, uh, jailhouse, because we want to know how those mitigations um, impact the overall um, behavior of the systems when we, when we have um, a virtualized layer um, underneath our operating system. Please keep in mind that complex RT payloads may vary from the tests that we made because we have no inter-process communications within the real-time context and these measurements shall, shall just give you 
uh, an overview of how those mitig uh, or a tendency of how those mitigations might affect your system. So what does our measurement do? We have uh, in user space um, the cyclic test in the beginning uh, runs and it wants to simply sleep for one millisecond. It calls the kernel to set up the timer. The kernel says, okay, I'll do that and go to sleep because it has nothing else to do. Later, after a millisecond or so, uh, it gets an interrupt from the timer and it dispatches the timer. It sees that cyclic test requested a timer and it will forward it to the user space again. And the user space will then measure the chitter. The, this is the time or the time delta between the timer where it, when it actually occurred and, it wa and when it was expected to occur. So the chitter is the time window where the interrupt occurred and when we measured um, the actual time when it, uh, when it uh, yeah, arrived in user space. So how do those mitigations affect our system? We have certain points where the mitigations now take place. For Intel x86 systems or for the Cortex A57 for instance, we have uh, to apply the page table isolation mitigation when we switch the context from user space to kernel space. As well as when we leave uh, the kernel space again, we, again, we, we have to uh, apply the meltdown mitigation. For uh, the system call, for instance, we have to apply the mitigation for variant one, the no speculative array accessors, because the system call is dispatched in an indirect array access. Always, uh, when it comes to the point where we have an indirect jump, like a function pointer or something like that, we have to apply um, the return trampoline mitigations. And at some other points in time, we also might want to use the, um, the microcode extensions, uh, the new instructions of our systems for um, speculative uh, yeah, protection, version two protections. So we have certain points that might affect uh, the behavior of the latencies. The second test where we put additional load on those systems, we have a second user space process running with a lower priority than cyclic test. Again, cyclic test wants to sleep for one millisecond, cause the kernel to go to sleep. The kernel sees, oh, okay, I have another process that could now, uh, that I could now activate. It schedules to the stress and chi. Stress and chi runs. We do not know what stress and chi actually wants to do on our system, so there might be further system calls in between. We do not exactly know what it does, but when the interrupt occurs, stress and chi will be uh, preempted again, and yeah, the kernel will schedule back to our cyclic test. So now we have more mitigation points, uh, especially on every um, switch of stress and chi down to the kernel space, we have an additional page table isolation call. And let's say we are in the middle of um, the page table isolation when an interrupt occurs, when the, when the interrupt occurs, then we have to finish the page table isolation before uh, we, can, um, we can handle the interrupt. So this, adduces, uh, this, uh, this introduces additional overhead that is relevant for uh, the jitter of the system. So this is the, the explanation of the measurements that, um, that we were doing. And our target systems are a Intel x86-64 system, um, a server system, a Xeon E5 processor, fourth generation, an AMD x86 system, a Midland system, Ryzen 2700X, and for ARM64, we um, did, did those measurements on an NVIDIA Jetson TX1, which is equipped with four Cortex A55, A57 cores. So, first of all, we somehow had to get our systems under control. And this took more time than expected because we had undesired high latencies on our systems. There were many, uh, many tweaks and tunes that, um, yeah, we had to we had to do to, uh, to run, to have a system where we can actually run our mitigations on. So this was a lot of work, um, but it was nothing, sp uh, nothing special. Um, you can look at this wiki page if you want to know on, uh, if, you, if, if you want to know how you can strengthen your system um, to become more, um, yeah, or to become real-time capable. In addition to that, 
uh, we also wanted to reduce the noise of, um, of the system. So uh, we want to get rid of interrupts on the course that we are measuring because we want to measure the effects of the mitigation and we do not want to measure the system as such. So we isolated the CPUs uh, where we run our measurements on. We rebound the SMP IRQ affinity uh, of some IRQs to the non-real-time CPUs. We rebound net device queue affinities to non-real-time CPUs. We disabled machine check pause um, and some other tweaks. We've realized that if we are running on, um, on separate NUMA cores, that we, that we also have some undesired high latency, so we decided not to leave NUMA cores if we have more than one socket uh, on our system. Turns out that the, um, the task set parsing in cyclic tests currently is broken. This is already reported upstream. So the first few days we measured on random CPUs on, uh, in contrast to the CPUs that we actually wanted to run our measurement on. So we had some bugs there. Then on stress and chi, we had some problem on, um, on the behavior of stress and chi together with the FIFO scheduler um, alarms and Real time, this is somehow broken because alarm timers will uh, never be propagated to the user space if um, the CPU is 100% on the load because they run on the soft IRQ context. These are much details, um, but we are currently um, working on, uh, on these issues and we have workarounds um, to run our measurements though. Yeah, and uh, the fun didn't end, so we had more issues uh, to deal with for the different mitigations. We had to exchange the microcode on x86, so if we want to run the no protection variant, then we had to use old microcode, whereas if, if we want to apply um, the variant 2 mitigations, then we had to switch the microcode to newer versions. So a lot of reboots, a lot of um, uh, research which microcodes uh, variants actually do what thing. On the Jetson TX1 on the, AM, uh, on the ARM64 platform, we were uh, missing official uh, support of the ARM trusted firmware, um, which implements the, the SMCCC version 1.1 interface, so uh, we had to build it on our own. Compiling was easy, but getting it running on the target was not that easy. Um, we have different kernel variants for the different measurements. For instance, if we have no protection and we want to deactivate um, the return trampoline and so on. We also had some issues with our virtualized environment with the jailhouse hypervisor. We had numerous uh, traps um, that we didn't see before that were because of high um, highly parallelized loads on many CPUs. On ARM64, we were actually missing uh, proper Spectre Variant 2 mitigations on our hypervisor. Um, we have a proof of concept implementation already running. Uh, proper patches to be mainlined uh, are in work currently. So we had obstacles in the whole system stack from bugs in the user space to misbehavior in kernel space, issues in the hypervisor and also in the firmware. Um, obstacles in the whole system stack. To the results of our measurements, let's look at the Xeon E5 system. So on the left side of this plot, you see um, the behavior of the system when it is uh, not under load, so the no stress variant. On the right side, you can see um, the result of a cyclic test when the system is under uh, additional load. On the x-axis you can see the latency in microsecond that occurred and on the y-axis you can see the number of occurrences where this specific or where this particular uh, latency actually occurred. Uh, the vertical uh, line uh, denotes the maximum latency that occurred um, in this measurement. So without load, we are somewhere under five microseconds, and if the system is under stress, then we are somewhere under 30 microseconds, which is pretty okay uh, for such a systems. So now what happens if we turn on all mitigations for um, the system? All mitigations, for, all mitigations that are required for the system means we especially activate spectral variant, a mitigation against spectral variant two and against meltdown. And then this graph looks like this. <laughs> 
So it's almost, or it looks like, this would be a constant shift to the right. We will later see that this is not the whole truth. Um, but yeah, it, it, it looks consistent. So uh, we do have additional overhead. Um, doesn't matter if you have no uh, if you have no, uh, the no stress case or the stress case. We introduce additional latency on the system. So now, what does it look like if we only activate um, the page table isolation mitigation without Spectral Variant 2? The results are pretty consistent. We are somewhere between no protection and default protection. So if we activate PTI only, um, we are somewhere in between. Turns out that at least for our workload, um, the Variant 2 only, the Variant 2 mitigation of Spectra costs more than the page table isolation. Yeah, but can we be sure, can we really trust these results? And this is where we need proper statistic analysis and where I would like to hand over to Wolfgang. Yeah, that's true. So we were wondering, I mean, I can ascertain you that Ralf, uh, after doing all these measurements, after doing all these complicated setups, really started looking like uh, Doc, um, Doc uh, Brown, it's Doc Brown, right? In the uh, third picture, so we decided to take some of the load of his shoulders. That's where the two of us come in. And yeah, the question is, so what do the data actually tell us? Can we learn more about the um, system behavior than just uh, the maximum latency and the distribution? And the second question, of course, is can you trust our measurements? Can we trust our measurements? That's where the statistics come in, but uh, despair not, I'm only going to take a few minutes to convince you that this is right without uh, going into the details too far. So um, in a traditional real-time system, in a traditional hard real-time system, you'd be mostly concerned about the maximum latencies because if you um, exceed these maximum latencies, people may die if you're in a safety critical system. Uh, for preempt RT, the kernel that we've been looking at, the situation is usually not that bad, so people use it for audio processing, for video processing, and you may be annoyed if you maybe skip a frame or if you hear a glitch in your audio recording, but uh, you're most likely not going to die. So it's not just the maximal, the extreme values that are important, but also the uh, behavior of the distribution. And by precisely checking the um, behavior of the distributions, we can actually also handle the second question, namely, can you trust our measurements? And to do that, that's the, the answer to if you can trust us or not is in these graphs. What we did is use the so-called shift function method. We basically would like to learn, um, do the distributions differ by a constant shift? Is the spread different? Do they differ in, in more properties? And to learn about that, we uh, split up the values into different portions, decile. So we take the first 10% of the values and compare these values with each other. That's one point in these diagrams. We take the next 10%, the next 10%, and so on, and compare these portions. From A to C, we have an increasing amount of measured data points. What you see from these graphs is that actually the, the, um, the differences between the case with all mitigations on and no mitigations is not just shifted by a constant amount, by a constant increase in latency, but the latency increase, since we have an upward slope, gets worse and worse uh, the larger the latencies become. So if you're already in trouble, then you're even more in trouble with uh, the, pre with the um, spectrum mitigations. Now, since we compute the comparison between the portions of the distributions, we can use proper statistics to do a so-called uh, bootstrap resampling to estimate confidence intervals. I'm not going to discuss in detail what a confidence interval says, but um, that's indicated by the bars, by the vertical bars. And very roughly speaking, the longer the, the uh, length of the vertical bars bar tells you something about the uh, quality of the estimation procedure, so how well we learned the true difference between the distributions. You see the quality is not so good in case A, when we don't measure sufficient data points, but goes, becomes better and better and better until D. If we looked at the final data, then these bars would disappear because we have very precise results that you really can rely upon, that's, uh, that you can statistically rely upon. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with further details, so we can do that for the other measurements as well, same result. And um, if you want, the key message to take away with you is uh, 
Bayesian people would maybe talk about credibility, about I'm repeating Ralph's words. What we're telling you here is the truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth, and statistics shows we're right. Thank you, Wolfgang. Okay, let's continue with the AMD system with the Ryzen 2700X. Um, this is the, the distribution of the latencies is pretty similar to the, to the Intel processor. <clears throat> In this graph, you again see um, the distribution of the, laten uh, of the latencies uh, with no protection activated, no protection between uh, means. There are no protection and default protection in the AMD case means uh, we have um, a, a new microcode version for, for the AMD processor and the Spectra Variant 2 mitigation activated. We do not need uh, to protect against meltdown because the system is not affected by meltdown. So if we again activate the default mitigation, we, had, we have the same consistent picture as for the Intel uh, processor, but it doesn't affect um, the overall behavior of the system or of the workload that we are measuring uh, that much. Okay, let's have a look at the NVIDIA Jetson TX1, the Cortex uh, A57 system. Again, these are the results without any protection uh, enabled. Let's activate the default protection. Default protection means we have an update of the ARM trusted firmware um, together with yeah, an update of the untrusted firmware together with um, the mitigation enabled in kernel space so that it uses uh, those, uh, those mitigation paths. And this is what it looks like on the ARM64. Uh, we have a drop of latencies uh, somewhere here. We do not exactly know what happens or what causes this, uh, this decrease uh, of the number of uh, occurrences in this window, but we assume that in this window we, um, we take the path um, to the system monitor which eliminates um, a certain range of latencies. Okay, these were all the measurements without virtualized environments and now we will also have a look um, on how those systems be behave when virtualization enters the game. And this is where I want to hand over to Jan. Thank you. So virtualization is considered for, for two reasons. First of all, one, as Ralph already mentioned, if we are running in a virtual environment, what is the impact? What does virtualization does with it? Uh, a second question, we may wonder if uh, we can use virtualization also as a mitigation, possibly. So first of all, uh, we picked one hypervisor, which we uh, knew best for this case, um, which is not representing the whole ecosystem, of course. Um, the hypervisor is a specifically tiny and small one. Um, there are separate talks about this. Just to remember, this one is targeting static partitioning only. It does no scheduling. It just does one-to-one -one resource assignment, and it's specifically designed for hard real-time, which is a good candidate in this case as well. It has some specific uh, properties here. In general, static partitioning um, allows to reduce a certain set of attacks or avoid them simply by, by separating them via the virtualization or via the partitioning approach. Um, that is a positive aspect. Um, furthermore, uh, Jailhouse has some uh, non-standard mitigation built in against um, the known issues um, simply by avoiding what these issues what, what the attacker usually exploits, exploits the confused deputy scenario so that um, a kernel or a higher privileged um, part of the system is tricked to leak information about um, things that shouldn't be leaked. Um, that has been the, uh, um, avoided in Jailhouse by now. Um, it's a sim similar approach, um, just simpler uh, like Hyper-V is doing as well. Um, so you cannot leak what you cannot see, simply talking. Um, and this, of course, also raises the question, um, can we use static partitioning instead of using these, well, not uh, cheap mitigation methods? Also a question. So first of all, collect ground truth. Um, so you see in the buff, uh, the bar you already seen, that is basically the number on the, on the Xeon system, on the multi-core system running our benchmark. And below you see, well, uh, virtualization, surprise, surprise, isn't for free. Um, so you see an increase of the maximum latency of the same um, yeah, real-time workload just running in a virtualized environment. Um, so um, you primarily see, uh, well, you, one aspect you see is the hardware-induced virtualization overhead, but this is just tiny. 
Um, um, it can be a few nanosec 100 nanoseconds, um, up to a few microseconds. But the bigger part you see here basically is the unavoidable interception of virtualization of the multi-core workload. So numbers may look better if you are not on the multi-core real-time workload but a single core workload. But anyway, this is what we got on this um, 8 CPU setup. Now let's add the mitigation. So the buff bar you know already, um, so there's an overhead. And below you see now, um, under the virtualized environment, um, the mitigations on Intel specifically, well, they scale. Um, so it become worse, actually. Um, so the overhead virtualization is introducing, is uh, yeah, magnifying, so to say, the slowdown that the mitigations um, yeah, cause here in our system. So just to confirm this, we also looked at the uh, ARM system, how does it look like here? Well, uh, first of all, even worse. Um, the primary reason here for this ground truth comparison here, uh, why it's so much higher under virtualized environment, well, on an Intel, on uh, x86 Intel, we can exploit direct interrupt injection into the gas system with this um, static partitioning approach. We can't do this on ARM system, on this ARM system specifically, so the overhead of any kind of interrupts happening um, here is even higher um, on, on ARM than it is on uh, x86. So we have a significant increase without any of the mitigations applied between bare metal and um, virtualized. With, uh, with mitigations enabled, um, yeah, well, we have a uh, further increase, of course, so now the numbers are getting worse. And you see here, just like we saw before um, on x86, actually, um, well, there is a small, or there is a noticeable increase of the uh, overhead the virtualization brings to the mitigations. And the overall overhead we see here also of virtualization compared to a full mitigated bare metal system, well, this is worse than, well, um, so it's not really, uh, the solution in this case is not really taking virtualization. Simply, um, it comes with a cost. Um, still, um, virtualization, partitioning also offers some kind of mitigation that we don't get from individual mitigation because um, there is a potential that uh, by splitting the workload statically, you can mitigate what we do not even know today. So it may be a little bit of future-proofness as well. Um, so this is a, would be a benefit to consider um, also for a real-time system. Furthermore, um, real-time systems are also often systems which you do not like to touch in the field anymore. Um, and if you can use uh, partitioning as a mechanism to split the real-time part from the potentially more affected non-real-time part, from the exposed real-time part, um, you, there's a potential that you can keep your real-time part unpatched, unmodified, and if you recall the, the backports of all these mitigations to older kernel, they weren't without um, yeah, some glitches and some efforts as well. Um, you may not want to apply them on your running systems. So this is a potential also an alternative uh, path this way. What you have to keep in mind regarding virtualization, as I said, virtual, uh, Jailhouse is a very lightweight approach here. It's possibly the best case you get architecturally um, regarding the impact of the mitigations. Uh, to be fair, we haven't measured other hypervisors. This is just derived from the design aspects. But you can easily imagine there is no LT1, uh, L1 TF dynamic uh, mitigation applied in Jailhouse by architectures not needed. At the point where you have a hypervisor design which needs it because it does, for example, scheduling, the impact will be much higher. Yeah, thank you, Jan. So let's come to the conclusion of this talk. Um, I want to, I would like to repeat that um, the histograms that we showed you only investigated one specific workload and must not be generalized to any real-time workload, but they um, should give you a, tendencies, a tendency of how uh, your system might behave when those mitigations are applied. So go out and measure your own workload, your own uh, real-time workload when you want to uh, apply, those uh, apply those mitigations. And as I said uh, at the beginning of this talk, those, the, all those mitigations uh, only have a local attack surface. So usually you do not execute arbitrary code from untrusted parties on a real-time system, on a hard real-time system. So um, you have to, uh, yeah, to raise the question if you are actually affected um, by, uh, by these local vectors. So unless no one is able to execute um, real uh, work, uh, 
the arbitrary code on your system, then you can also turn off those mitigations, especially, for instance, if you have no network connection on your real-time system. We still have some open issues. Um, as I said, um, we have problems with the preempt RT alarm timers. We have problems with cyclic tests, broken task sets, and we are still working on proper Spectre version two, variant two mitigations for ARM64. So, thank you very much for your attention, and I think we still have a couple of minutes left uh, to answer some questions. Thank you. Um, did you measure the impact of the microcode only when you have the old microcode and the new microcode? So the question is if I did measure um, the impact of the microcode only without applying um, the mitigation. So the microcode bring new instructions. Um, we did not measure the microcode only, but I would expect and now it's the question, what does the microcode do? That would be, that would be an interesting measurement. So actually, I would say um, that it only makes an, uh, a difference if you really execute those instructions. But you would have to measure it to exclude that it doesn't do any other voodoo magic, of course. No, we didn't do this measurement. But with our measurement setup, we could, uh, if you're interested in this, we can repeat that. Further questions? Okay, so again, thank you very much. <clears throat>